received her PhD in geography uh, from the University of Neuchâtel in 2021. And um, Dr. Vlonga has been studying mobilities and immobilities in the Barton Valley of Tajikistan. She has published many peer-reviewed articles on mobility, land attachment, involuntary immobility caused by low accessibility and environmental risks. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Uh, Tobias uh, Marshall, who will be here in a moment. He recently got his PhD in anthropology uh, from the Geneva Graduate Institute. So we have a Swiss uh, team today. Um, Dr. Marshall is a researcher and also a photographer. And uh, he, his dissertation is titled The Image of Remoteness, Alterity and Mobility in Eastern Afghanistan. And it's based on long-term fieldwork in the Wakhan corridor living with and following in their journeys, the Kyrgyz of Afghanistan. And it's a very timely event as um, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty released an article yesterday on the Kyrgyz of Afghanistan, trying to leave Afghanistan to Kyrgyzstan and who are now stuck at the border with Tajikistan. So um, with our panelists today, we will understand the context. And I now give the floor to um, Dr. Tidil Mustanowski. Hi, everyone. Uh... It's a great pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I would like to obviously thank Melanie and everyone at the Central Asia program. Um, let me just share my um, presentation and then get started. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, wonderful. All right, yes, um, in the following, I would, um, I would like to explore forms of infrastructural connectivity um, that perhaps don't often get discussed together. Even though Chinese presence in Central Asia has really been intensively uh, researched over the past years, uh, I think much of the discussion still happens within the boundaries of either regional dynamics or uh, bilateral relations. And I think looking at the Pamirs as really a broader interconnected historical, sociocultural, uh, but also political space, I think is really useful in this regard. Um, I think it also offers the opportunity to include um, not only Tajikistan, uh, Afghanistan, and to some extent China into the discussion, and more than that, and uh, my apologies if I go beyond uh, the theme of this, the, the webinar, I think Northern Pakistan comes into the picture here as well with the history of infrastructure development that is really interwoven um, with uh, Central Asia on, on many levels. So just uh, very briefly, I've conducted fieldwork and archival research um, on this uh, sort of broader area of the Pamirs since um, uh, 2008, first in Tajikistan along the Pamir Highway, then in Pakistan along the Karakoram Highway, and most recently in uh, 2019 on a construction project in Eastern Afghanistan that has been aimed at creating a road link to China. This uh, most recent uh, research has been part of a collaboration with uh, Tobias Marshall, who hopefully is gonna join us in a minute. Uh, Tobias and I published a co-authored chapter on this research in my uh, book, Infrastructure and the Remaking of Asia, which is just uh, fresh off the press. Um, and the book, by the way, is open access. You can download it for free from the link uh, shown on the slide. So what we do in the chapter is that we analyze past and present road construction projects that have aimed to uh, basically interlink different parts of the broader region beyond uh, today's nation state boundaries. And uh, we thereby situate Afghanistan's efforts to build a road to China in a much longer history of modernization projects in the region. So essentially our argument is that these ambitious large scale road construction projects, which have been tools of uh, state making and uh, also propaganda for a very long time, have um, in many ways also interacted with uh, much less visible networks of routes that enable um, the movement of people, goods and uh, information in the region. So in this regard, in particular, it, I think it needs to be emphasized that while Afghanistan's road to China might never be completed, and we can discuss this um, in the Q&A, these thoughts of future-oriented projects nevertheless 
change social, economic, and political dynamics in, in the very cron concrete settings in which they get built. But looking at emerging infrastructural connectivity between Afghanistan and China through the lens of trans-regional historical developments, I think is also an important um, uh, history for uh, many other reasons. First, uh, such infrastructural interventions always build on what is already there. And in the case of Afghanistan, as much as uh, in Tajikistan, these are actually existing and functioning former Soviet built infrastructures such as roads and bridges. The second point is that infrastructure projects in the broader region have not only been part of physical encounters, but uh, I think should also be seen as shaped by ideological interactions across borders. So the first infrastructure landmark that I would like to briefly mention is um, obviously the Pamir Highway, which the Soviet built uh, on the territory of today's Tajikistan. The Pamir Highway transformed connectivity in the Pamirs um, dramatically with construction beginning in the 1930s. The road enabled um, uh, sort of an enclosed Soviet system of transport and provision. Um, in relation to southern Kyrgyzstan. And this, uh, of course, came with a violent process of transformation in eastern Tajikistan, which was effectively based on cutting kinship and economic ties to neighboring regions in China, the Afghan Pamirs, and the Wuhan, um, um, including a militarization of the border. For most of the second half of the 20th century, Mm, the possible sections of the Pamir Highway were located between the train hub um, of Osh in southern Kyrgyzstan and the town of Kharok at the Tajik Afghan border. And almost all provisions for eastern Tajikistan arrived on this road. And this strong orientation towards southern Kyrgyzstan in terms of supplies um, also remained in, in place until the, the late 1990s. And even during uh, the Tajik Civil War, I, I would like to mention here, from 1992 to 97, this um, old uh, supply route was uh, really in full swing and was also used as a corridor for humanitarian aid. Now, this setup in many ways continued until the early 2000s, when Tajikistan and China um, uh, resolved remaining border issues and opened a road link. The following economic reorientation from away from southern Kyrgyzstan to China has had uh, quite profound consequences also for people's everyday lives in the region. Because many continue to rely on mobility to Kyrgyzstan, um, now on an increasingly decrepit, uh, precarious and underfunded stretch of road. But uh, the Soviet infrastructural endeavors um, were not limited to the territory of the Soviet Union alone. In uh, the Afghan Wakhan, in particular in the years of the Soviet invasion, uh, 79 to 89, this involved um, a quite a strong infrastructural engagement. These projects, mostly a transport infrastructure, were um, obviously of military significance in this context. Uh, but they also did change local mobilities and they became avenues for Soviet humanitarian aid in the Wakhan. So some of the Soviet bridges and tracks for military vehicles that lead up to um, Soviet army outposts that you actually see here um, um, on the slide at the border with Pakistan, they continue to be used. Then when we look at the, the Afghan Wakhan from Central Asia, the, the focus often lies on um, connectivity or the lack of connectivity between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. And in this um, equation, Northern Pakistan often um, tends to fall out of the focus. And this, even though there have been continuous economic, political, linguistic, and religious interrelations between all these areas. In fact, even in the colonial period, um, in the British colonial period, and uh, during uh, the Cold War, um, following that, infrastructural interventions in northern Pakistan were very much linked to what was happening across the border in the Soviet Union and uh, Afghanistan as well. Here, um, as you can see on the slide, records from the India office in London, they show how already the British colonial administration was concerned about construction projects, about roads, airfields in the Soviet Pamirs. 
And then in independent uh, Pakistan, such concerns transformed into an anti-imperial, anti-Soviet alliance between Pakistan and China from the 1960s. And this alliance materialized in um, the now certainly iconic Karakoram Highway connecting Islamabad and Kashgar in China via northern Pakistan. The Karakoram Highway over time has been part of um, a number of processes of transregional and geopolitical significance. The highway served to showcase uh, the Pakistani-Chinese alliance and also related economic and military aspects. But it also integrated and legitimized Pakistani rule over its northern areas, which continue to be disputed in the context of the Kashmir conflict. The Karakoram Highway also established Pakistan's army as a major player in infrastructure construction and logistics, for instance, uh, through the Frontier Works organization and the National Logistics Cell. And these are organizations that um, for years facilitated the supply of weapons to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And, uh, and we shouldn't forget about that as well, they paved the way for the Pakistan um, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is now part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that really imagines sweeping road connections from Central Asia to the Arabian Sea coming through there. So to, to come to uh, some sort of conclusions, um, if I may, I would like to highlight two points. First, when we look at um, many of these construction projects over longer periods of time, they are in fact um, I believe outcomes of interactions of many different state institutions, companies, NGOs, multilateral institutions, and also locally driven initiatives. And in that sense, um, I would like to see these roads more like patchworks than centrally orchestrated construction sites. For instance, when we look at uh, the post-Soviet period, the construction and maintenance of the Pamir Highway has really been funded and implemented by a myriad different donors and companies. Most prominently, um, looking at the road link uh, between the former um, Soviet road and the Chinese border, which was opened in 2004. Um, this was counted to many expectations, uh, an outcome of uh, neither funding nor building by China. The dominant funding institution for this was in fact um, the Islamic Development Bank with Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey and Kuwait granting most support and um, the, the company executing the work was um, a, a, a giant um, a Turkish construction company, Entis. Then finally, um, uh, sort of the, the second concluding point, infrastructural interactions across multiple borders uh, also have repercussions for processes on, on local scales that I think often remain very, very much absent from large scale analysis. And in my overview, I sort of deliberately not included these pathways and alternative routes as I'm quite certain Susie and Tobias will give us detailed insights into this in their talks on Bartang and the Afghan Pamirs respectively, but I would like to emphasize uh, to conclude that I really think it's important to analyze these less visible connections and circulations as sort of standing in constant interaction with the larger scale yeah. infrastructures oh, okay. yeah. that I um, have described in my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Joe. I, um, I lost you for, for a second so i couldn't hear the last words but i think that's uh uh that was your your conclusion thank you so much for um, the visuals as well um it's always helping so i'm i will now give the floor to uh dr suzy blondin um who will uh present her her work on a more local scale hi everyone can you hear me well yeah so thank you to the Central Asian program and thank you to Melanie for organizing the, this panel. So yeah, as uh, Teal mentioned and as Melanie always, uh, also mentioned, I will uh, try to adopt a more uh, local perspective now. Um, so yeah, and I should not forget to, to share my screen. Um, so here we go. 
Mm. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the title of my presentation today is Environmental um, Hazards, Materiality uh, and Mobility Justice uh, in oh wait, I'm I'm I see that it's not the uh, right uh the right slides um so well i will just start uh, slowly and and share um, it's a, it's such a popular research that um Susie <laughs> has been presenting for a while and like, she's uh, confused with so many yeah <laughs> so the title of the, <laughs> of the presentation is um studying the environment mobilities nexus to reflect on remoteness and connectivity uh, inside from uh, Tajikistan's Pamir Mountains. And here, uh, here is the presentation. Yes, here we go. Yes. Um, so, um, so this presentation discusses uh, the specificities of Central Asia uh, regarding the environment mobilities nexus and highlights the adverse impacts of climate related uh, mobility disruptions for the population of Central Asia and especially of the Bartang Valley, where I have conducted uh, extensive fieldwork. So here I want to focus on uh, infrastructure and logistics, a perspective which I think uh, helps to understand how climate justice meets mobility justice. And uh, my work, uh, you will see clearly connects with Till's work, uh, as I've been very uh, inspired by his, uh, his own research. Um, and yeah, here I'll try to bring a more contemporary and also uh, climate related perspective. Um, so my, my main, my, yeah, my research um, questions the relations between mobilities and environmental conditions in Central Asia, and especially in the Pamir Mountains. And it mainly addresses hazard related uh, mobility disruption and also place attachment. Uh, meaning what encourages people to remain um, despite important environmental and socioeconomic issues. And um, as I said, I've conducted uh, field work in the regions uh, for nine months uh, with mainly ethnographic methods and also what I called um, uh, mobile methods, meaning that I've traveled with residents uh, either by, by shared cars, uh, uh, walking or by bike and so on. Um, and the idea was to observe uh, how daily mobilities were, were practiced. So the, the aim of uh, the presentation here is twofold. Um, I want to highlight the often neglected issue of the impact of climate change on mobility infrastructure and conditions, and to position the region of Central Asia in the scholarly discussions on the relationship between um, climate change and small scale or everyday mobilities. And discussing the case of the Bartang Valley will hopefully uh, help exemplify uh, these processes. So my presentation is based on three um, articles or chapters that are recent or even forthcoming. Uh, you have all the, the references on the slide. Um, the, first, uh, the first one you can see um, adopts a mobility justice perspective and uh, try to, to underline the importance to look at infrastructure and materiality. And uh, the second one written along with Melanie um, adopts uh, a more historical and political view on remoteness and connectivity in, in the region. And the third one is a more pol policy oriented discussion on the links between human mobility and climate change in Central Asia. Um, so first, let's see how mobilities impact climate change in, in Central Asia. So um, recently, multiple studies have uh, provided evidence of the impacts of transport and mobility on climate change globally, of course, through CO2 emissions, but also through the production of electricity. And uh, in addition, the mobility infrastructure itself impacts the environment since it occupies land and generates air, noise, and light pollution, for instance. So increasingly studies um, in Central Asia are raising the issue of um, poor air quality in, uh, in cities like Bishkek, Almaty, and Dushanbe. Um, these cities have been uh, highlighted as cities that expose their residents to higher than recommended uh, levels of air pollution. 
and a large number of vehicles exceed the norms of emissions of harmful substances into the atmosphere. Um, and Central Asian countries actually don't have um, um, uh, special standards for old emitting cars. And uh, as uh, you may know, in places where public transports have stopped operating after the collapse of the Soviet transport system, uh, marshrutkas or minibuses have emerged as a bottom-up solution to the lack of, uh, of uh, public transport. So um, these minibuses offer flexibility, but they contribute significantly to the high, level, um, high levels of air pollution in Central Asian cities, because often old, um, vulnerable and highly polluting vehicles are used as marshrutkas. And um, these, these minibuses constitute the only uh, shared transport um, option in some region, uh, especially rural ones, including Tajikistan, Viloyati uh, Mukhtorik, uh, Kuistani, Badakhshan, so the, the region of uh, Tajikistan's Pamirs. Um, and even in cities where buses or tramways operate quite well, public transport remains expensive for a large uh, part of the population, uh, which of course uh, creates um, social inequalities. And while uh, vehicles are central when thinking about the links between mobility and climate change, it's also crucial to address the impacts of the mobility infrastructure itself, such as roads, railways, or airports. Um, this infrastructure also provoke uh, pollution that may have profound impacts on the environment. And in Central, um, uh, in Central Asia today, road building projects are numerous and many are large scales. Uh, Till already mentioned the, the, the Chinese government's um, Belt and Rose Initiative, the BRA, um, whose, whose imp uh, environmental impacts are often overlooked. And as the studies shows, the BRI crosses fragile environments like forests, steppes, and permafrost. And building roads, railways, or harbors uh, has obvious negative impacts on ecosystems, biodiversity, or wildlife, wildlife, for example. So this means that in Central Asia, transport uh, has a high environmental cost. And although this could be said of every part of the world, Central Asia has a specific issue of a lack of um, public transport, combined with a um, heavy reliance on old and polluting minibuses and private cars. Um, and current building projects in the region also raise the issue of the ecological impact of the mobility infrastructure. So while mobilities impact climate change, uh, climate change in turn damages the mobility infrastructure itself and may disrupt uh, mobility. So this is what we, we will explore now. Um, so first we can, for example, mention the effects of uh, environmental disasters on mountain roads and on rural urban mobilities. Uh, as you may know, mountainous areas represent, represent a large part of, the, of uh, the Central Asian territory, especially in Tajikistan and in Kyrgyzstan. And a, a huge portion of the residents of these countries live uh, in mountainous areas and regularly have to travel uh, along roads that are highly vulnerable, for example, to rock slides, to floods, to avalanches, uh, landslides, and so on. So these hazards are not new and have always been part of uh, mountain dwellers' lives. But however, climate change increasing the frequency and the inten intensity of these hazards or sometimes limits their predictability. Um, for instance, the melting of glaciers increases uh, the runoff of many rivers, uh, which triggers floods. And in addition, permafrost is present in many areas throughout Central Asia, and its thawing poses a threat uh, to engineering infrastructures, including roads, of course. Um, and in this context, road maintenance requires significant funding and human resources, especially in uh, remote areas, which often does not seem to be the priority of local governments. Um, and in the face of uh, environmental hazards, roads and paths are not the only things affected. We can also mention uh, the old vehicles that are uh, highly vulnerable to challenging road conditions in, uh, in Tajikistan's Pamirs. Um, for example, in the Pamirs, old four-wheel uh, vehicles are used as shared taxis in the absence of public transport. 
Um, and these shared car trips um, involve frequent stops for repairs and sometimes include uh, unexpected overnight stays after a car breakdown, after cars breakdown, sorry. Um, so given the remoteness of the region from the main markets, uh, purchasing car parts or um, repairing cars are always uh, or usually a long and costly process. Uh, so this definitely puts into question the residents' mobility capacities, their safety, and their potential to move back and forth uh, between rural and urban areas. And another example of how climate change impacts mobilities in, in Central Asia is the effect of extreme heat uh, on asphalt and uh, on asphalt and railways. Uh, but I will not develop um, this point today as our focus is on, uh, on the Pamir mountains. So let's now move to, to the Bartang Valley. So um, in, Bart in the Bartang Valley, the only car road is frequently rendered unusable uh, on some portions by rockfalls, landslides, floods in summer, and avalanches in winter. Uh, these hazards affect roads, vehicles, and traveling bodies, and make journeys impossible, arduous, or at least physically challenging. The road is often blocked for some hours, days, or even weeks when the level of the river is particularly high during uh, some summers, or when huge avalanches are hard to clear. Uh, the challenged materiality of cars, bikes, or, or, or even shoes <laughs> reminds travelers of the difficulties posed by a road located in a narrow valley, uh, often at the level of the river and without, uh, and without any rockfall protection. So such weather or biophysical events collide with a mobility system that is already vulnerable. Uh, as I said before, there is no public transport in the region, and a very and there is also a very small number of uh, number of cars in some villages, and fares also remain high for uh, most residents. And because disruptions are frequent, and state-led maintenance is not enough to ensure the accessibility of the region, um, residents are used to repair roads on their own, or at least to to attempt to do so. And um, so th these road closures, of course, uh, pose a threat to the communities who depend highly on these roads to access products, healthcare, and work or educational uh, opportunities, for instance. And, um, and the residents of rural areas who represent the majority of the Central Asian uh, population are uh, particularly affected by, by mobility disruption since their livelihoods and quality of life depend on rural urban mobilities, and especially since the end of the local Soviet provisioning system that Steele mentioned. Um, and at a wider scale, this vulnerability um, to environmental hazards reduces economic development and international cooperation. Uh, and climate change acts as a threat multiplier in regard to, to these processes. So even though, of course, environmental hazards are not the only reason for mountain dw uh, dwellers' lack of mobility capacities, the fact that these um, essential mobilities can't be realized uh, when roads are closed um, raises the issue of the habitability of uh, affected areas. For instance, the low mobility capacities force residents to make choices between job opportunities and family commitments. And women are particularly vulnerable in this regard, given as their, um, uh, as their role as main caretakers in the region. Or they have to choose between resettlement and long absences and separations, for example. So while the residents of Bartang are very strongly attached to their valley, uh, they often point out, um, uh, point out that their, their road represents a ser serious risk to their livelihoods uh, by threatening food security, socioeconomic opportunities and, and general well-being. So quickly to sum up, um, I would say that given uh, Central Asia's uh, topographical and climatic specificity and uh, region's environmental and uh, vulnerability, there is an urgent need to examine uh, the way mobilities and climate change intersect in the region. And it is, uh, I think, crucial to ensure that populations can dwell and circulate in city suburbs 
rural or mountainous areas by improving public transports and the resilience of uh, infrastructure in the face of uh, environmental hazards. Um, as you know, Central Asian societies are very mobile between rural and urban uh, areas and also between Russia and Central Asia, for instance. So they need to enjoy sufficient uh, mobility capacities. Um, and yes, many studies in, um, let's say, in the field of mobility studies have showed how translocality may represent a strategy uh, in the face of climate change and also in the face of, uh, of uh, many soci socioeconomic issues. Um, that's why these rural urban uh, mobilities are so central uh, to the livelihoods of, uh, of uh, rural populations. And I will stop here. I hope I was not too long. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Susie. I think, unfortunately, um, Tobias could not um, could not join. Uh, so, um, so it's it's unfortunate as uh, he has some very interesting um, fieldwork experience and, and research to, to share. But um, that gives us more time to uh, to discuss, and we already have a, a few questions. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the audience for. Uh, for their interest in, uh, in, in those questions. Um, your, both presentations um, actually gave a, a voice also to the people uh, affected by all these uh, projects. Uh, and they tell us a lot, a lot about um, infrastructure projects, which promise and glorify uh, connectivity, economic benefits, and, and a better quality of life. Um, and we'll, we'll have a few questions uh, linked to those mega projects um, um, that especially uh, Till talk, talked about. Um, so uh, I'll start with um, a question uh, for, uh, for Till, but uh, Susie, feel free to uh, answer um, if you have any insights. Um, what is your, your thought on Chinese government grant and, and road construction of the portion between uh, Dushanbe and Khorog? Um, and how um, how is it going to change if if it's going to change uh, any economic and social dimension in both Tajikistan um, and Afghanistan? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, that question. I mean, um, I'm happy to to answer this question. Uh, I'm, I should emphasize though that uh, my information on this is based on publicly available information, and I haven't been able to. Um, conduct research on this on site um, in the past years for obvious reasons, the pandemic, but also because I have um, a number of different research sites now that have me pulled away from, from the Palmyra Highway more specifically. Now, um, from what I can uh, tell is um, that um, on the one hand, obviously, the, the, these kind of reconstructions, this maintenance work um, of the Palmyra Highway is in a sense important because people are um, quite dependent on, on connections between Dushanbe and, and Kharog in particular, and then up into the Eastern Pamirs. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it also always depends how these uh, things are being implemented and what this means for Tajikistan uh, at a larger scale. And, and there I'm, I'm uh, quite skeptical because um, these uh, sort of grants, and in particular this grant uh, that is very high, I think initially was around 200 million US dollars, uh, then sort of, I think uh, the, the, the money eventually granted was 125 million, um, but still an enormous sum for Tajik, uh, um, the Tajik economy. Um, these sort of um, grants are extremely opaque. We don't know about the conditions. Um, we don't know uh, sort of what really happens to the money. And um, uh, first of all, uh, it really impacts people on a, on, a, on a very, very concrete level in their everyday lives, because if you have um, a, a hundred kilometer road stretch along um, the Bahamia highway that gets reconstructed, that gets rerouted for um, efficiency reasons, you will have evictions. And there were evictions. Um, um, the road had to go through people's properties. And um, it's doubtful whether these people have been compensated appropriately. Then there's another dimension to this, which I think uh, maybe uh, Susie can um, can allude to this. Um, perhaps you have looked into this in more depth. Um, the the environmental impact that this uh, this stretch of the road has, 
And I think that question is in particular important because um, at the same time as this grant sort of went through, um, the Belt and Road Initiative also gave itself this uh, kind of green um, a green aura and started to kind of employ the the, the 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 language of green Belt and Road guidelines, et cetera. So, so more uh, environmental responsibility. And it's really doubtful whether uh, kind of this is more like this is anything more than than rhetoric. Then the last point that I would like to add in this uh, particular case, I think, is that we should always see that on the one hand, it's extremely important for people to be mobile um, um, in a very concrete way for people who live in the Pamias to be able to, to connect to uh, Dushanbe and, and also places in between. But um, the way the, the Tajik government organizes um, trade with China on the Pamir Highway, um, trade on more local levels is very much um, also restrictive to how people can uh, participate in this sort of economy. A lot of the transport companies are actually owned by the presidential family or cronies um, of the presidential family. And um, a lot of the potential benefit, economic benefit that could go into uh, local communities gets um, completely absorbed by the center um, in all sorts of ways that uh, we could discuss um, for hours here, but for which I think there is a lot of evidence at this stage um, from offshore bank accounts to who owns these companies um, to who gets into what political positions, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's the, the, the darker aspect of, of this whole investment. Thank you. I turn to uh, to Susie. To do, do you want to to answer uh, Till's remark on the environmental aspect? Yeah, unfortunately, I think I don't have much to add, but I'm also very skeptical because um, so actually I haven't uh, conducted uh, empirical research on uh, these matters, but I've uh, tried to make um, a short overview of uh, um, yeah, some, uh, some of the uh, uh, um, environmental or supposed environmental uh, impacts of the BRI uh, in Central Asia. And uh, and I really think that uh, yeah they they have to adopt this uh, uh, green uh, rhetoric, but I I really doubt that uh, how I mean how can such a big project uh, be green after all? So um, yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a big uh, big issue and. Um, and yeah, I think it's very important when we talk about the BRI and uh, uh, the, these prospects of growth and, and better connectivity and so on to remember that um, uh, many of uh, many um, most residents who live away from uh, uh, the Pamir Highway from the M41 um, are uh, very marginalized and I don't see any, uh, any perspectives in um, uh, I don't see how the, the these uh, let's say secondary roads are going to improve. So uh, yeah, this is also something we should consider when we talk about uh, uh, an improved connectivity. But for whom, uh, in in which conditions? And as uh, Till said, uh, it's also very difficult to see how uh, local populations can benefit from uh, uh, from the economic opportunities. So yeah. I think uh, I think I, yeah maybe I'm mostly repeating what Till said, but yeah I, I completely agree. And speaking of, um, of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, there's a question about how much growth is expected to come to the Pamir uh, Valley if we have any projection or any idea of that. Um, Till, you mentioned open source data. Do you, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, I'm not an economist at all, and that's not what I'm specializing in, but um, it probably depends a little bit what you mean by growth here and in relation to what, right? So uh, what I tried to emphasize um, earlier is kind of the way a trade is shaped in, in the region, um, especially the connectivity to China and how um, kind of more local scales of trade are, are being sidelined, um, like essential roads don't get, um, repaired while um, roads essential for centralized trade do um, get a lot of attention. 
So I'm not I'm not sure there's any kind of um, uh, solid data on on economic growth in the Palm here. I, I'd be very doubtful. But if anyone has a an kind of inputs into that, I'd love to see that data. Um, I think uh, by and large, we really have to see that um, what we talk about here is an economy that is is largely dependent on 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 labor migration still in the Palm years overall. If growth comes from something, then it comes from from labor migration, but there we actually see um, rather decline, right? Over over the the, the, the past three years, uh, yes, remittances have have quite dramatically declined for all sorts of reasons to the palm years. So I'm not sure these infrastructures are geared to create growth on a local level in the kind of economic understanding that probably the question was was aimed at. Thank you. Um, there's uh, another question linked to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative about um, more specifically the, the projects uh, and the infrastructure. Uh, does it include a railroad through uh, this area, uh, through the Pamirs, and uh, what would be the sort of the, the map? Um, will the railroad uh, follow the highways or be more direct through and around the mountains? Um, I remind everyone that the premiers is still a constrainous terrain in a high mountain uh, region. So that of course raises the question of uh, the type of infrastructure. Um, I don't know, Z Susie, I can quickly say something um, about it. Maybe you wanna go first if you have something. All right, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think there is like any serious plan for a railroad going through the Pamir Mountains, nor through Afghanistan, nor through Pakistan. Um, I think these are, um, it's not only the terrain, it's really, really also the political will. I think if we look at um, um, where railroads um, are in the planning, um, then we can see that the terrain is not um, so much different necessarily. So there is um, the railroad, uh, the China, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan railway, which which actually has um, certain potential of getting realized in, well, I don't know, the coming decade or the coming decades, I'm not sure. But in any case, the three governments have actually signed an agreement um, last September to build this railway. And that would lead, obviously, from, from Xinjiang to, to Kyrgyzstan, um, and then on to Uzbekistan. So I think that's a much more realistic um, railroad connection that we will see in the future. Um, and there, we also have to see that the um, very different economic considerations are in the play. On the one hand, um, I think this railroad is meant to connect multiple mining projects in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, that's one point. And then the, the Kyrgyz government also has a very strong interest in developing the center of the country. And that's exactly where this railroad is supposed to lead through. And it is, um, in in some ways, I think it's going to parallel um, uh, certain highways, but it would also create uh, very new sorts of connectivities there. So that's, I think, the railroad to look out for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Susie, do you have a um, comment? So maybe just to add, but probably this is obvious to, to most of, um, of our participants today, but that in, uh, in Tajikistan's Pamirs, the idea is to, um, to develop the existing road, the existing highway, uh, and uh, I don't see uh, any, yeah, any ways of um, uh, building new roads, new itineraries. Thank you. Um, I will. There's another question this time more on the, on the local uh, scale and uh, you both really elevate the voices of people uh, who live along um, uh, these roads in your work. Um, would, you, would you say, and that's a question for both of you, uh, would you say that people who live along uh, or next uh, to uh, these projects uh, welcome connectivity? Do they resist connectivity or do they welcome a certain type of connectivity? What's, What's your um, insight from the field and from uh, your, your field work that you both conducted? So, Maybe we can start with Susie, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I uh, speak from the perspective of, uh, of the Bartang Valley, which is uh, uh, away from uh, these, uh, these big projects, 
um, I can say that of course the uh, the relations uh, the relation to remoteness and connectivity is very paradoxical um, because um, and I think uh, yeah it's a shame that Tobias is not here with us because I guess he has a lot of um, uh, insights on these matters uh, but people in the bottom valley uh, to stress that uh, it's because they are so remote that they uh, they have been able to preserve many uh, cultural traits many um, uh, yeah different cultural elements and they have uh, they, they like to express pride for uh, uh, for this remoteness and they also say that because they are so remote uh, it made them uh, uh, stronger physically it made them endure so much and this is something that is very valued uh, in their culture to um, to endure to be strong and so on uh, to be patient as well when the road is closed or when uh, uh, trips take um, hours and days um, so it's I think it's very hard to uh, uh, to promote uh, more connectivity uh, and uh, more mobilities just uh, without reflecting on uh, on yeah on these very cultural perspectives and um, and for example uh, I mean another example is uh, for example people in Bartang uh, told me that uh, um, when the, uh, in cases of unrest, in cases of conflicts, uh, they are happy to be uh, far away, to be, uh, uh, they, they see their valley sometimes as a refuge. Um, so this is also something that uh, uh, that should be yeah, taken into account when we think about uh, possible uh, positive aspects of uh, remoteness and lack of uh, connectivity. Till, do you have um do you yeah, have sure. from, um, uh, yeah, yeah, another absolutely. part of the Pamirs. There, there's a lot um, I could talk about here, but maybe I, I jump anywhere with something that I did together with Tobias now that he, he can't be here. Um, I maybe talk a little bit about his research um, uh, to the extent I'm kind of capable of, of reproducing this accurately. But uh, so, so what we did in Afghanistan was basically um, looking at um, a road extension that that was conducted sort of around um, 19, uh, 2018, uh, 2019, and that was aimed at creating a connection to, to, to the Chinese border. And that was a, a project funded by the Afghan government back then, obviously not the Taliban government, but the previous government. Um, and um, indeed, they made quite a lot of headway. And uh, there was never kind of the idea that uh, China would open their border to Afghanistan. I think that was pretty much clear from the beginning, but it was a, a, a kind of an endeavor to connect um, uh, sort of the Wuhan in a broader sense and to the Chinese border and then see what happens. Now, um, this created a lot of contestation as well as opportunities on, on, on a local scale, apart from this bigger idea that we need connectivity to China, which um, uh, probably is not going to happen um, anytime soon. Um, in, and in fact, can it create a connections between the lowland Wuhan and uh, the, 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 the very high Afghan Pamirs where the Kyrgyz live. And there we could see that sort of this emerging connectivity um, wasn't actually a newfound connectivity. It was a, a, a different form of connectivity. So when this road came up there, it changed, um, for instance, the way people from the lowlands in the Wakhan could find employment up in, in the Afghan Pamirs as, as shepherds for the Kyrgyz, for instance. And um, for the Kyrgyz, uh, from sort of uh, what I recall um, uh, from, from Tobias's research, there was very much sort of a split opinion between, um, on the one hand, seeing this as, again, kind of an economic um, opportunity in, in one sense, but then also um, the cultural endangerment that uh, Susie was uh, talking about. But uh, at the same time, there was also always um, um, a certain level of transnational connectivity up in the Palmias that did not necessarily change with this road because, um, and that, that, by the way, that did not um, um, include any sense of remoteness at all. You had Chinese soldiers up with the Kyrgyz there and tanks and jeeps and motorcycles. There just was no road, but you could still navigate on this high altitude plane. So there was a lot of connectivity. Kyrgyz up there 
um, had a lot of interaction with um, both uh, the, the the Tajik side, the Chinese, and the the Pakistanis when when certain um, groups of Kyrgyz went as traders to the Pakistani border and and, and traded there. So I, I think it's it's kind of a mixed bag. It's never um, like going from disconnectivity to connectivity, and then kind of there is a contestation. It's kind of different modes of connections that that are going on, and 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 different segments of of societies that um, sort of assess this positively or, or negatively. Thank you. We we may have a um, few minutes for one last uh, question. Um, Till you you briefly touched upon um, the role of the center, the political um, center. Um, do you, and uh, the question is both for Till and, and Suzy, do, do you think that um, connectivity renders those areas that are remote um, or the people living in those areas more legible for the state, both in Afghanistan and Tajikistan, or even for international actors such as China, is, is connectivity um, making those areas more legible? Till you can go if you if you have insight. <laughs> All right, um, I try that. I'm not sure about it. I mean, it, it's maybe not that um, there is not the possibility of legibility, le legibility, but maybe that's also a question of political will <laughs> um, to actually uh, want to read your margins. So I'm not sure about that. Um, and I think I, I leave it at that. Uh, I, I think yes, it opens to, it opens potentials, but whether these are um, um, kind of made use of, that's an entirely different question. Susie, do you have a concluding remark on, on that? Um, I see there, there was a question also on, um, on the, uh, the, how much the Tajik government is supportive of uh, these projects, uh, given uh, the current situation uh, in the Pamir. So I think it connects to the previous question. And uh, this is, I mean, this is a really important question. Uh, personally, I, uh, I haven't been to the region for uh, more than two years now, and I so I don't know exactly. Um, this is also a question that I that I have, uh, but I think it connects with what we said earlier that um, how can th that the Tajik government needs uh, uh, to imp to improve uh, the connection to China through the Pamirs uh, through the um, the Pamir Highway, uh, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, um, that it will really help uh, the population itself to be more connected to the to the center and to to Dushanbe. Thank you. We are we're hitting the end of, uh, of this webinar, and um, uh, I'd like to thank um, Tilen. And... Can I just jump in? Only one yes. one point because I think it got promised to be answered live. Um, there was an extremely important question, and I, I think um, I'm, I'm very sorry I jump in here. It, it was no, no. basically about mm -hmm. sources and local actors, and I think that would be a super important question to still answer and not to kind of um, jump over. If that's okay for you, yes, feel free. Yes? I, I think my my end was spammed, and um, I don't have much uh, visibility on on the every question. So feel free. Yes, please. Yes, because there was. Let me see. There was a really important question. Um, I can't see it anymore. It got kind of it jumped out. It probably got marked it as answered. Um, but in fact, we did not answer it. Um, so it was by Yamuri yeah, Shah. And the question was, what are some of the ideological um, um, connection and connectivity along the Pamis? But the, mo the more important part here, I think, is the archives that you mentioned. It's uh, directed to me. Um, are there any archives in Persian? Are there local archives? And I think that's a super important question when we talk about um, when we talk about infrastructure, because so much of infrastructure research is based on economic data. Uh, I mean, large scale companies, um, um, uh, obviously government um, government information on that, media articles that are really kind of very overview like. Um, and here, I think uh, I would like to mention two points, um, both um, with respect to, to the Pamias uh, proper in, in Tajikistan, but also with, regard, with regard, to, 
to Pakistan, there's um, so much data out there on infrastructure by um, populations who live with these infrastructures. So in the case of um, the Eastern Pamias, the Kyrgyz population uh, is a very rich um, local culture that uh, sort of talks about the road and what the road means for people. And there's um, local collections in private homes that one can access to actually study these infrastructures. Um, generations of road construction um, workers who have all in their families somehow been involved with infrastructures that um, have written down things about it, that have written poetry about it, that um, don't just include uh, Tajik or Russian, really Kyrgyz as well. And then um, the same I encountered along the Karakorum Highway, um, where you have a very rich um, um, Persian, still in, the, in, in colonial times, um, and reaching into the 1960s, and then Urdu literature on, on, on infrastructure, because these infrastructures have brought such dramatic changes to these societies that they are reverberated in all sorts of um, literatures that I think are really important to study. And then finally, not to forget the many biographies of engineers and um, political planners that are out there as well, that are often not, you know, that kind of gray literature, self-published, especially in Pakistan, you find a lot of this stuff when you go to local bookshops. Thank you, Till. Uh, I think, Susie, you, um, you did hear poetry or songs about roads uh, in the Batang, or am I mistaken? Yeah, I, I think some um, some people and one of, uh, of our common uh, colleague in the region um, who is an historian uh, knows, for example, about uh, this poetry and a lot of uh, elder residents for in the Batang uh, know about uh, about this poetry. And I think also that some folk songs that are very well known all throughout uh, um, Tajikistan, actually, not only the Pamirs, uh, mention about difficult trips and accidents. And so, yeah, I think that, that this question of uh, uh, difficult journeys and uh, remoteness uh, are extremely present in, uh, in Tajik folk culture. Thank you so much. There's uh, there's space for more research and um, uh, to to give a voice and to elevate the voices of, of, of the people there and their thoughts on on those concepts as well. Um, I, I'd like to to thank uh, Dr. Til Mostolonsky and Dr. Susie Blondin, um, and I, I would like to thank also the Central Asia Program for the for the support um, and the technical support as well. Um, I, um, I'd like to, to, to remind the audience that we were supposed to have also uh, Dr. Yes Marshall um, with us, but for um, some technical issues we couldn't. Um, I um, invite um, the audience uh, to, to check um, the publications of our speakers um, because we only had a, a snapshot of their research. Um, and uh, if you're interested in anything uh, connectivity, infrastructure, or premieres. Um, these are the people you wanna you wanna read and listen to. Um, I apologize for the people who um, asked questions that couldn't be answered, um, and I hope this is a, just a, a means to to launch another event um, on this topic or any related topic. Um, so thank you all. Thank you. Um, Till and Suzy, and I, I wish everyone a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Bye bye. Yeah, yeah and feel free to, to reach out. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Bye. Yes. Thank you.